Hi folks, um, welcome to our virtual public meeting talking about visitor use and experience for Grand Teton National Park. My name is Rachel Collins. I'm going to be um, our moderator tonight um, and this afternoon going through um, our presentation here. Wanted to just really thank everyone for carving out the time to get, uh, be with us. Going to run us through a couple logistics before we get into the meat of our presentation. Uh, we are in Teams Live today um, for this meeting. So a couple of features if you haven't joined us for a Teams Live event before. Um, up in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a little Q&A box. Um, we are gonna be doing Q&A as a part of this presentation. You're welcome to enter Q&A um, or questions at any point. Um, during the presentation, we're going to be collecting them in the background, kind of organizing them into themes. Um, so you're welcome to do that um, and use that ask a question feature um, to ask any of your questions. We'll also take a pause after the slides to allow folks to be able to just listen to the presentation and then put your questions in um, during that pause before we start the Q&A. Um, also, uh, if you need to adjust sound, you're able to do that down in the lower left hand corner is the sound adjustment and also closed captioning is provided within the meeting um, and there's that little closed captioning box there for you um, to be able to turn that on if you need it. So once again, um, wanted to welcome folks to the meeting. Um, and we are seeking your input on desired conditions for both the park as a whole, as well as specific management areas in the park. So on the screen um, is an image of Jenny Lake, which is an area within the park. Um, and looking for what are our goals for these areas in places that have pedestrian traffic and vehicle traffic. Um, we want folks to know that your input um, will help shape how we provide visitor experience for years to come. And so we want to share with you what we've been working on on this and also ask for your feedback. During today's meeting, you're going to be hearing from three different presenters and a few more folks for the Q&A. Um, so on the screen, you see images for our superintendent, Chip Jenkins, will be sharing with us um, some background on the project. Uh, we'll also um, be hearing a little bit more from me, uh, Rachel Collins, uh, about the work that we're working on, as well as from Dr. Jen Newton, the park social scientist, about work that is ongoing in the park and all of the information that is informing uh, the process that we're going through right now. So as a bit of an overview on the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are now, where we're going with this visitor experience work at Grand Teton, how you can be involved, and then, like I said, turning to that Q&A. So with that, I will turn over the mic uh, to the superintendent at Grand Teton National Park, Chip Jenkins, to walk us through where we have been. Hey, thanks, Rachel. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in this afternoon and evening. We really appreciate that you've taken the time to uh, uh, to be with us here this uh, this evening, uh, and because your thoughts and your input matter tremendously as we plan for the future of Grand Teton National Park. But before we start talking about the future of Grand Teton National Park, we should talk about where we have been. And I have frequently gotten the question of uh, when is the National Park Service going to start doing more active management of uh, the visitor experience here at Grand Teton? And the reality is the National Park Service has been doing visitor use management at Grand Teton for a very long time. In fact, it's been going on for almost 100 years. It's a story older than the park itself. At key moments, in our history, we have learned that there are better ways for us to achieve our resource protection and visitor experience goals. Um, and we have leaned into those times and the park is better for it. So I'm gonna highlight a few key moments in our history uh, uh, to, to uh, help us understand where we have come from. So in the 1920s, uh, 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 just about a hundred years ago, uh, the first active uh, management of visitor experience began to take place. In fact, actually, it was around one of the most popular places today, Jenny Lake. 
um, at the time in the 1920s, people could disperse camp, meaning you could drive your vehicle, um, put out a tent campfire anywhere around Jenny Lake. And uh, the impacts of dispersed camping became so great around Jenny Lake that actually the first constructed campground in Jackson Hole was created there and we continue to use the Jenny Lake campground to this day. In the 1940s, the, the National Park Service developed a master plan for the park. One of the principal things of that master plan, it called for two roads, one an outer highway for high speed travel that would enable people to go to and from the community of Jackson, uh, Du Bois, uh, and, uh, and other place uh, rapidly. Uh, while at the same time, there was an inner park road for a slower, more contemplative park experience. In the 1950s and the 1960s, there was a massive federal investment in this area where there were millions of dollars that were spent to support visitation and spur economic development. That federal investment included building hotels at Jackson Lake Lodge, building hotels in Coulter Bay, building the campgrounds at Coulter Bay, Lizard Creek, Signal Mountain, and Grovant, uh, creating the marina at Coulter Bay, Leaks, and Signal, and over 150 miles of trail, including uh, the trail that in 1970 was built up Granite Canyon to connect with the new tram that had just been uh, constructed at Jackson Hall Mountain Resort. As we moved on uh, into the, uh, uh, in the 1970s, the park completed a master plan. One of the key factor, factors of that master plan were, were two things. You'll hear a bit more about it later in terms of zoning the park for dis different kinds of visitor experience, but also a decision to cap the number of overnight accommodations, cap the number of hotel rooms and campsites that were in the, in the park. In the 1980s, backcountry use had grown so much that a management plan was needed uh, that helped us uh, figure out how we could continue to provide high quality backcountry experience while also preserving uh, the natural resources and a high quality experience. And out of that master plan came the concept that we continue today where there are designated camping areas and we manage the camping areas there through a permit system. In the 2000s and 2010s, in response to increasing visitation, uh, the uh, dilapidated visitor center in Moose was replaced by the Craig Thomas Discovery Visitor Center. Uh, the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Reserve was donated to the park, along with the associated trails and visitor center, uh, and a, a very significant rehabilitation of the Jenny Lake area uh, was completed. There was a uh, transportation plan that led to building the multi-use pathway in the pathway system in the park that connected with the pathways in the surrounding communities. And in response to uh, uh, increased visitation at Jenny Lake and people uh, um, with the growing uh, bear population, the grizzly bear population, the park started the Wildlife Brigade and the String Lakers uh, comprised of volunteers to actively manage uh, uh, visitation. So we are making really, really intentional choices about how uh, to manage for a quality experience. Uh, the National Park Service here at Grand Teton National Park has a long track record, in fact, 95 years of actively managing visitation, making hard choices and adaptively, uh, adaptively adjusting to changing condition. And this sets us up for where we are today and how we need your help to figure out where we need to go. And so to uh, learn more about where we are today, let me introduce Grand Teton National Parks, Dr. Jennifer Newton, the park social scientist. Thanks. Great, thank you, Chip. Uh, I really appreciate that. And also just want to echo Chip's appreciation for everyone who's joining us today and sharing their evening and afternoon with us. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are um, and what that means. And so essentially the park we've been using social science and the best available information that we have to better understand visitor use and visitor experience in the park. 
And so we've worked with contractors and university partners on several different studies, some of them site specific and some of them at a park wide scale to give us a better understanding um, of visitor use and visitor experience within the park. These studies have focused on transportation and visitor movement, visitor motivations, perceptions and quality of visitors visit to the park, as well as information like visitor activities, perceptions of resource impacts, demographics, and the influence that visitors have on other visitors. Next, I'm going to share some key insights from these studies. The first insight um, is about changing visitation. And so overall, visitation is increasing to Grand Teton National Park. Additionally, with that increase in visitation, we're also seeing a mismatch between our operational capacity in the park and that visitation demand. So I'm going to share a few slides here that highlights that um, information. And so on this next slide, what we have is a graph that shows our yearly recreation visits, and that's the blue line that has those circle dots. That's our overall recreation visits to the park. And as you can see, it's ebbed and flowed, but for the past 15 years, that recreational trend has increased. That trend is shown here on the black dotted line. And so for the last 15 years, there's been a 32% increase in recreation visits to Grand Teton National Park. Additionally on this slide, what is shown is that orange line with the square dots is our overnight stays. And as you can see, that stays relatively constant. And so to Chip's point that he just made about us having a set um, capacity for those overnight visits, we're seeing that in these graphs and what that shows. In general, we have about 17% of our visitors stay overnight somewhere in the park. And so you can see that here last year in 2023, we were right on average with that 17% of visitors staying somewhere within the park and then the rest are day use. And so that 83% of visitors are coming from elsewhere and coming into the park each day. Additionally, I wanted to highlight 2019 and 2023 in particular. And so these years we had really similar recreation visit totals for the entire year. Each year had about 3.4 million recreation visits. But how that looked over the dispersion of the year was a little bit different. And so this graph shows that blue solid line in 2019, our busiest months were typical busiest months. So June, July and August were our busiest months that year. However, in 2023, uh, which is shown here on the orange dotted line, our busiest months were July, August, and September. And while that might not seem like a big difference, I wanted to show that that highlight here in September. Yeah, that little bump there uh, and in between where it doesn't look that great, but really it's an 85,000 recreation visit difference. And so really that equates to more than 2,800 visits a day on average coming into the park in September. And that's a time of year where in general, we're starting to close visitor centers. Um, we're starting to close down seasonal housing, potentially shutting down water as well based on the weather. And so really we have this mismatch of the operational capacity in the park at a time we're seeing increased visitation. Another insight that I wanted to share was about traffic volumes and patterns. And so we did a transportation and visitor movement study in 2021 to help learn more about um, how traffic was moving to, within, and through Grand Teton National Park at a park-wide scale. And what we found is that visitors are coming from many different locations and they're not necessarily going directly from point A to point B. And so they're not coming in through our entrance stations and going directly to, to a site that they're headed to. They're making these multiple stops. And so really we're seeing this auto touring style of visitation where folks are stopping at our pullouts, maybe our park entry sign, maybe a trailhead, maybe a visitor center. And they're stopping at these areas kind of randomly whenever you look at it holistically, they're stopping at different locations and there's not one singular pattern that really pops out um, whenever we look at these data. We also found that transportation and visitor movement study that overall there's not a big traffic congestion issue within the park. Most of our roadways and our intersections, they function really, really well. 
However, we do have some hot spots where we do have congestion, and we see that mainly in parking lots within the park. Another insight really highlights recreational experience and quality. And so as visitation to the park increases, we're seeing an increased density of visitors, particularly along high use trail systems and lake shores within the park. We also know whenever we ask folks about their motivations and why they come here, scenic beauty and natural quiet are key features that kind of influence their decision to come to Grand Teton National Park and really help contribute to their experience in a meaningful way. And so having that opportunity to spend time with family and friends, to relax and escape are often motivations of why folks come here. Additionally, with that higher use, we also get visitors that report some type of crowding, mainly at key high density uh, destinations within the park. For example, Jenny Lake or String Lake. Um, only a few visitors report that crowding is an extreme problem within the park, but many visitors do report a slight to moderate issue within the park. And we see that in many different data sets. And so one that I want to share today is a word cloud. Um, when we ask visitors on a park wide scale, what do you like most about your visit? And what we see is those similar motivations um, and key parts of the experience where we see words like scenery, wildlife, hiking, beauty, views all come out about what visitors like most. I think one of my there's a few different quotes because folks answered this in an open ended fashion and one of them is scenery and scenic overlooks saw more wildlife than we thought we would. Jackson Lake it's the most beautiful place. So we were getting these really robust, wonderful responses from visitors um, that really highlight that want to view scenery uh, and enjoy this space. We also asked folks what they liked least. And what we find whenever we ask an open ended are things like parking, crowds, crowded, Jenny Lake. And so similarly to like I mentioned with the transportation and visitor movement study, it's interesting that we find here that parking comes out as an issue in both that congestion and transportation and visitor use, but also on what visitors are saying they're experiencing and like least within the park. Also, some of those quotes also said very specific locations. So for example, someone was quoted saying, parking was hard to find at String Lake and Jenny Lake Overlook. Another person mentioned a couple of areas of high traffic and parking. And so it was really interesting as well for us to see these very different data sets and a similar theme coming out that parking at specific locations tends to be an issue for folks within the park. The last insight that, that I wanted to share was visitors' perceptions of resource impacts. And so we do ask visitors um, in surveys if they've noticed anything or how big of an issue things like resource impacts are. And what we find is, right, once again, visitors have that top motivation for viewing scenery and wildlife within the park. Um, and they're noticing whenever visitors park on road shoulders and these roadside impacts of scenery. They're also noticing things like user created trails and sites. And so when we survey folks and ask them about an issue or how big of an issue that is, they do report noticing those impacts of the scenery and those impacts to resources on user created trails and sites. We also hear about a loss of natural quiet, in particular that is related back to Bluetooth speakers in particular. And so I just wanted to share those few key insights that we had from some of the data and some of the learning that we're doing here in the park. And with that, I'm going to um, send it to Dr. Rachel Collins, who will talk a little bit more about some of the previous public comment that we've done. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, I did want to bring up um, the other input that is going into the work that we are going to share with you as far as where we are going uh, that contributes to where are we now. In addition to all the great science going on in the park and surveys and research that we've been doing, we've also been soliciting public comment. Um, so some of you probably participated in this with us last summer. Our focus area for last summer was how was your visit? Um, we wanted to know from folks uh, what's going on with their visit to Grand Teton. So we asked a couple focused questions we really wanted to better understand issues and opportunities related to visitor use, access, and experience. 
Um, and we wanted to help orient folks to the larger process um, as well as where we could improve and what we should keep doing. So we wanted to be gathering insights, perspectives on both issues and opportunities to help expand our conversations um, that we were having with park staff. We're so appreciative of all of the letters that we got during that comment period and all of that fueled into the work on where we are going now and what we're currently working on. We are currently working through the process of uh, implementing the visitor use management framework, or I should say, as Chip would know, continuing to implement the visitor use management framework at Grand Teton with our legacy um, of managing for quality use and visitor experience at the park. So we have been following this framework. This, um, what you're seeing on the screen is a circle graphic that walks through the four elements of the framework. Um, this framework is shared by the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council, which is all six federal agencies. Their logos are on the screen um, that manage lands and waters. And there's more information on this. We'll post it into an announcement um, of all the, where you can find all the Interagency Council's information on their website. More specifically, we have been focusing recently on this brown element of the visitor use management framework called define your management direction. In this component, we're working on defining desired conditions. Uh, as related to that, we're also thinking about what are the appropriate activities, facilities, and services within different areas of the park to help meet our goals um, for managing both resources and experiences. We really think that this is the heart of the framework because um, it really helps us figure out where we want to go and what we're trying to achieve. More specifically, desired conditions are the statements of aspiration. They describe our resource conditions, experiences, opportunities that we're striving to achieve and maintain in particular areas. They help us build a foundational understanding of what an area should look like, feel like, sound like, and function like into the future. When we craft well-defined desired conditions, this communicates a positive vision for the future, and it helps us make sure that we know where we're going um, and that we have a united vision for that. So on the screen, you'll see that there is a screenshot of the cover of our desired conditions guide book from the council that is also available online. And in a minute here, we'll post that into the chat. More specifically, I wanted to drive into some details because we're going to talk a bit more about what these desired conditions are. Desired conditions help us answer the question, what are we managing for? They help us describe the outcomes. They're not how we achieve that outcome, but they are the what we're managing for. Uh, they're typically written in the present tense because uh, they're things we're looking to achieve and maintain, but they help us look into the future. They also help us reflect shared values, which is part of the reason we wanted to share this with y'all uh, during this comment period. We want to make sure that people see themselves in these desired conditions and that through this process, we're cultivating a shared understanding of what is being managed for in the different areas of the park. They're also aspirational. These are goals. We're not gonna always achieve them all the time everywhere, um, but they are the things that we are trying to achieve and we're continually working towards. Uh, so we want them to be aspirational and we also want them to be specific, connected to Grand Teton specifically, not all national parks, but what are we managing for at Grand Teton? We started this process by working on park-wide desired conditions. There's more information on the park-wide desire conditions on the story map, which you can find on the project home site. I also, though, wanted to make this really local um, and share one specific park-wide desire condition or a chunk of one, because uh, it leads into the conversation that we're going to have next. Um, we pulled this one because it illustrates a really key point. Across the park, we want to be providing for a range of visitor opportunities where visitors who can find a wide spectrum of different opportunities that are social or solitude based, but all allow them to connect with nature and to find those experiences across the landscape. So while we have some park wide goals, we also have some area specific goals because we know that in a park as big as Grand Teton, we can't be all things to all people everywhere and definitely not all of the time. So the, we, what we have also done is break up the park into different management areas. 
um, because we want to be specific. And we do this to help us describe management differences. So the parkwide desired conditions apply to all management areas, but then we break it down under that larger umbrella um, to focus on different desired conditions for different areas that help us describe the different visitor opportunities in those areas, resource conditions and potential modifications that we might make to resources. I'll get into more detail on that here in a minute. And then what appropriate facilities or lack of facilities for those different areas might make sense. So um, Chip mentioned this a little bit earlier, but on the screen is an image of the um, visitor experience zoning from the 76 master plan. Uh, and so you'll see in this map that there are three zones, a green zone, that's the mountain zone. We also have a red zone, that's the valley zone and an orange zone that is the through zone that was this for scenic driving. And I'll add some orientation markers onto this map for um, modern places on here uh, for this. Overall, um, I we've been getting some feedback that people feel this. Uh, we looked at it internally as a park team and said this is brilliantly simple and strikingly accurate. Um, you could see the reflections of the park managing to this since that time. However, it's been a while since we've given this a refresh. Um, we have some new information from the science we've been collecting, um, and we can sharpen our pencils a little bit on this. And so that's what we've been working on and want to share with y'all. So we've taken a first pass at a refresh of the management areas, and that's the map you're seeing on the screen. It has the different zones in tones of blue, green, orange, and brown. Um, we're going to walk one by one through each of these different colors to talk about what they are and what we're managing for in those areas. Um, and you'll notice if we switched over to this map that in many ways it's quite similar um, to the map from 76 Master Plan. We're not aiming to create something new, but rather to update our toolbox um, and provide um, an additional level of detail that we maybe didn't have when we created the original map. So I'm going to start walking us through all of these and start breaking this map down. Did want to also let folks know we do have a story map that has more descriptions and people can spend time with that map online. And again, as we get closer to the Q&A, we'll go ahead and post that link into the chat so folks can focus and then go ahead and open the link. The link is also on the project homepage. OK, so let's start with road one. Road one is shown here on the map in an area that is outlined in red. These are the road corridor corridors um, that are along Highway 26. Um, we are managing for free flowing traffic in these areas um, where we're prioritizing people getting access to different resources. This management area also includes the airport and the multi-use pathway, but it's really designed um, for that um, travel corridors is basically what this one is. Road two is shown here in brown. Um, this is the map for zone two, and those are, yeah, the brown roads are shown there. The road to management area consists of the road corridors that pri prioritize the scenic auto touring, as well as access to other non-NPS lands. This area also includes multi-use pathways um, that runs adjacent to the park road and other key trailheads and access to visitor sites. On this slide, is another map of the park um, with the green dots. Those green dots show Front Country 1 management areas in the circles. The lands in this area are really meant here to serve a range of visitor, visitor needs um, as far as getting information, getting oriented to accommodations, food, supplies as you're kind of transitioning in those. Um, these areas you're going to see lots of evidence of human development. We've added structures um, to these areas in the built landscape to make sure that we can sustainably accommodate large numbers of people on durable and paved surfaces. We also have another front country zone shown here in a lighter shade of green on this map. This is front country two. This management area emphasizes visitor recreation and a transition away from those front country one areas. These visitors experience a transition from developed 
in densely visited areas to more rustic, more wild feeling, and more contemplative settings. These er this area appears less developed, more minimally developed, with most of the development in these areas related to trails and boat launches and that kind of recreation infrastructure. Next, we'll transition over into the backcountry areas. These will all be in blues. On this slide is a map that shows backcountry one. Um, that is in the dark blue. This management area includes the southern part of the Teton Range and the trails around Hermitage Point and Two Ocean Lake. The these are developed trail corridors. They also include popular climbing and mountaineering routes in this management areas. They're meant to introduce visitors to the backcountry of the park with more contemplative settings and connection for nature while also providing a potential for solitude um, for as visitors travel deeper into these areas. Backcountry two takes us up north to the north end of that mountainous range. Uh, that is in the um, teal blue uh, that's there. This includes areas like Berry, Owl, and Webb Canyons. This management area is managed to provide opportunities to connect with nature, frequent solitude, more of an escape from modern society. So this area appears mostly undeveloped with only primitive trails present in these sections of the park. Next, we have Backcountry 3. On this slide is a map for Backcountry 3, which is colored in the light blue. This area covers the central Teton Range, as well as most of the sagebrush flats between the Teton Park Road as, and the Snake River. Lands in this area emphasize resource protection, and visitor access is not facilitated by additional infrastructure and may require substantial effort um, for visitors to get into these areas. Um, but when you get into these areas, you find very few or no other people, prime opportunities for solitude, no developed infrastructure in these areas. And this is my last one, I promise, uh, is Backcountry 4. Uh, Backcountry 4 on the map on your screen is shown in purple. Um, this area covers most of the parklands on the Easter side, eastern side of Highway 89 and 191. This management area reflects the unique history that led to the eventual inclusion of parts of the valley within the park. So this area emphasizes resource protection, appears minimally developed with some moder moderate managerial presence um, on sporadic and primitive roads, including buildings and irrigation ditches, fencing. Uh, those who do visit this area find a really unique setting here with some opportunities for solitude, but you may hear traffic and see other visitors at a distance, um, which makes it a little bit different and why we call it out differently from the backcountry three or backcountry four areas. So happy, um, happy to answer any questions on those that folks might wanna put into the Q&A. We can go back to any of these slides, um, but before we jump to the Q&A, I do want to invite Chip back um, to give us a little bit of an orientation on how you can help. Um, with this process and what your role looks like as we go forward. Great. Hey, uh, Jen, Rachel, thank you so much for uh, the presentation here and the and the information. And as we said at the top of the top of this, and again, uh, you are uh, critical parts of this process. All of you who have uh, tuned in this evening, people who may be uh, watching a recording, uh, those who are reading this online. So um, if you could go to the next slide, uh, Grand Teton National Park needs your help. Uh, your feedback is ab absolutely critical. And so uh, we are taking your comments through August 12th. Uh, the way to submit them is on our uh, this website. And one of the best things that you can do is go to the story map, the link of which is on this website. Uh, to be able to get uh, additional uh, information, both that you can help digest and that you might be able to share with uh, friends, uh, colleagues, and, and other folks. Uh, and a key part of what we're doing is asking you to consider some key questions. Uh, the, the, it's really, while you may be having many thoughts about what it is that you, uh, you're providing, it would be really, really helpful if you would be focusing on what are the park-wide desired conditions, um, how they resonate with you, 
uh, uh, what types of park experiences and opportunities uh, uh, do you uh, uh, do you want to have experienced here? How do the desired conditions for each of the management area align with your experiences? And most importantly, what you might be expecting of the future? And then um, do you have any other comments or uh, uh, ideas about these desired conditions? Overall, the main question for you is, what should the National Park Service be managing for in these different areas of Grand Teton National Park? The idea is that we're not going to have one experience in Grand Teton. We're going to have many experiences in many different locations and helping us identify uh, uh, what those are is the central part of what we're doing right now. So how do you submit a comment? Uh, you can go to the uh, park planning uh, uh, web page. Uh, here is the address on here. I know in the federal government, it's not always the easiest address to use, uh, but you can go to the uh, Grand Teton Park Planning page and click on the comment now. Uh, and uh, that that is uh, where we need you and uh, others that care about Grand Teton to give us your thoughts about what we should manage for for the future. So uh, thank you very much.